So ladies and gentlemen, the next session is about mobile connectivity in the metaverse. So I've got uh, two esteemed guests, three esteemed guests to join me, and I'd like to invite them on stage. This is going to be quite a thought-provoking session. So my name is Angus John McCormick, and I'm here to moderate this session. And I would like to build on what happened in the previous discussion and make this really relevant. In fact, I just came here from the block stage where we were talking about cybersecurity and the blockchain. So this session, I would like to invite the other panelists to, jo to join me now and get them microphoned up. Okay, first of all, I would like to invite Samar Bichet. Samar, welcome. Samar is the founder and CEO of two companies. Today, he's going to talk about his Carrier One badge on. Welcome, Samar. Thank you. Thank you. And the next guest is Mr. Mickey Watkins, all the way from Barcelona and London. Mickey Watkins is the founder and CEO, co-founder and CEO because the other founders, of World Mobile. And World Mobile has a very big vision, as you can see. And lastly, I'd like to invite James Tag. James is the chief architect for World Mobile. So this discussion is going to bridge the world of blockchain, yes. Security, yes. Privacy, identity. But we're going to talk mostly about what's happening in the world of connectivity and telecommunications. So I've introduced my guests, and I will kick off by asking them the first question, and we will have a very provocative and stimulating debate. Gentlemen, your microphones are on, ready to go? Okay. Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing James. Test. Okay. So my first question goes to Samar. Samar, would you like to introduce yourself, your mission, your vision, what you're doing this, to this audience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Samer Bichet, CEO and founder of uh, Carrier One. I'm also wearing another hat as a traditional mobile operator, uh, Iristel and Ice Wireless in Canada. So we operate in, uh, in the Canadian airspace uh, with uh, rural remote connectivity, so we're considered a regional operator. Uh, Carrier One is kind of my brainchild of uh, deploying a decentralized uh, mobile network uh, using uh, you know 5G technology. Actually, it doesn't really matter which G because that will change. But uh, the idea is to democratize the airwaves and have people build mobile independent network operators. Um, basically, micro networks to feed the chain, no different than how solar panels are. Uh, when you feed it back to the grid, except now you're contributing to deploying the next G network and, uh, and uh, being part of that shared and circular economy. Now, the inspiration really came from um, being in Canada. Maybe not a lot of people know this, but we have a very tightly controlled oligopoly that, that basically there's only three players and it's an equal share distribution in terms of the market share. So each operator has literally 33% of the market, which is unheard of anywhere in the world. And to top it off, if, if you compare it to the US as an example, uh, the concept of an MVNO, there's about 200 MVNOs running independently in the US. In Canada, we have zero MVNOs, and all the brands that are out there are actually controlled by the incumbent. And obviously, I don't blame the incumbents for that. I, I, you know, I'll put the blame a little bit on, on the government allowing them to, to have such um, a, a tight control. But nonetheless, that's where the inspiration from, came from. And that's where we want to revolutionize that industry and, and, and have people bring and be part of that uh, ecosystem. Thank you, Samar. So here we are talking about today metaverse, blockchain, gaming, etc. The problems that Samar has outlined there. What, Mickey, can you introduce yourself and what your vision, mission is, what you think the problem that we're trying to solve here today in this discussion is? With, with pleasure. I'm Mickey Watkins, I'm the CEO of World Mobile. First of all, I believe that every human on the planet has the right to connect to the internet. That's the most important principle that I adhere by. 
World Mobile is a new economic model to incentivize people to build mobile networks where there currently aren't any. It's an infrastructure play with some fantastic technology, which James will talk about later. And more than that, it's a new business model that distributes the wealth back to the people. Thank you. James, James yeah. Tag. So why are you here? What, what do you want to share with the audience? Well, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what you need to do to get the metaverse work with cellular. Um, so my background is I'm a, a, an inventor. I also built a, a multi-country mo mobile carrier. So I have a little bit of an idea about what goes on in a mobile carrier. But the main bit that I bring to this panel is uh, the physics. You know, what do you have to do to get a virtual reality experience to work for the metaverse? What bandwidth are we looking for? You know, how, how can you do that so that it's uh, an acceptable experience? So James, I'm gonna pass it straight back to you then to elaborate on the kind of problems that we, people maybe don't think about that can be the problems we want to get on this journey from the point of view of virtual reality, augmented reality, metaverse, but starting off with the blockchain as well, because World Mobile, as Mickey has highlighted, is a different model. So from a technical point of view, what, do you, what problems do you see being roadblocks? So the main way that uh, metaverse, metaverses are built today is that uh, you know, your practical experience is you take a large NVIDIA GPU and you strap it to your back, which doesn't sound like a difficult thing to do if you just buy a card off Amazon. Um, but the batteries to, you know, to support it will weigh about 20 or 30 kilos for you to be able to experience that for 20 minutes. So your big problem at the moment is that you have to carry the, the compute with you. So if you try and take that compute and you, you, know, you put it at the corner of this room, you now need to get that compute to your, your headset. And that's tricky because if you look at this conference here, everyone in this room is sharing the bandwidth of a particular carrier. So if you've got your iPhone up at the moment, you'll be on a particular band on that iPhone, you'll be sharing all of the bandwidth. So you might have, I know, a megabit tops uh, capacity to your handset or your Oculus or whatever, and that's nowhere near what you need. If you've got twin HD displays, you're going to be wanting, you know, 30 megabits, maybe maybe a lot more. Um, you can, 300 megabits would be quite good, right, if you're trying to do the display correctly. And the other thing is you want low latency. So you want to be able to shoot the alien and they shoot back and all that happens in under 10 milliseconds. So our, if you take your digital watch or whatever and you try and start it and stop it as quick as can, you'll, you'll practice that for a few hours now. I will have installed this meme on you, right? Um, and you'll get that down to about 14 milliseconds. So we've got a, an ability to, to operate down to around 10 milliseconds. Well, modern, even 4G networks are gonna be in the 60, 70 millisecond range if you're lucky and probably not more like 100 and 120. So you need very high bandwidth and very low latency to get the metaverse to work you know, on a headset that you can walk around with and experience either as you know, true virtual reality, completely independent, or mixed reality, which a lot of people think is gonna be the, the, the more significant piece. So James, I'll probably ask you to elaborate on that a bit more later on. Uh, but you being an inventor, you know, and, and talking about those challenges, they're, they're pretty fundamental if we're to realize that vision. I'll hand over to Mickey now, because obviously World Mobile is doing some unique things to solve this problem around the world. So what are you doing, Mickey? What is, it, what is World Mobile's relevance to Metaverse or to specifically to blockchain or telecoms? Because it's a real business model to try and make all that happen. It's a huge, huge vision, huge mission. So we build connectivity. Um, as James said, to have a true, a true metaverse, you need to be in a position where you have very low latency, very fast internet. Uh, this is something that all companies are, are aiming to build, um, but isn't there right now. But there are varying levels of metaverses, right? The fully submersive virtual reality experience that, that one could experience, um, which is delightful. Um, but there's smaller, lighter versions of metaverses that people can interact with. And as we build in emerging markets and in existing markets, um, we can see that people are in a position where they're able to uh, connect, right? 
And as they're able to connect, they're able to start to experience this. And we, we do also believe that the future technology will allow people, but custom installations are one thing, and then ubiquitous coverage is another thing. So we're using free space optics, alternative spectrums, as Samir just said right now, it's no longer about the G, right? We got excited for 3G. Um, it was a big disappointment in, in reality. Uh, 4G came around and 4G was fantastic. It changed everybody's life on, on the telephone. 5G has its complications. And what's the 6G? You know, the 6G really should be the convergence of all of the spectrums available to use. CBRS, um, free space optics, everything that you can get a hold of to be able to then broadcast that to many people so they, they can begin to immerse themselves in these either fully immersive worlds or worlds that are, um, are lightly immersive. But either way, we see this technology aiding and you can't use a metaverse without internet. You can't use a metaverse without connectivity. So the base layer of everything is, is connectivity. So you're gonna be delivering that and we'll come back to that. So Samar, you know, we, Mickey and James have touched on Spectrum on technology and this is the future blockchain summit so what uh, what are you going to do to change the world in this respect with cario one what we're what we're creating is a platform that enables scalability disruption and most importantly the opportunity that comes with it um, what blockchain does is if if you think telecom there's a lot of projects that you know they use the buzzword blockchain like SaaS back you know a few years back just to attract investors not every project is meant to be a blockchain project however telecom is one of those uh, fundamental I'm gonna call it a layer zero layer zero because it's the foundational block of how people interact today if you're at a conference and you run into somebody you're communicating with that person you don't necessarily have to trust him. They don't have to trust you, but you're transacting in some way, shape or form and maybe, you know, planning a meeting after whatever it might be. It's a transaction. And if you think about blockchain, it's literally that foundational block that allows people to interact on something that is a zero trust system built into it inherently. Um, and and you can, you know, you don't have to trust me. I don't have to trust you. But there is a consensus mechanism that allows you to perform that transaction seamlessly and digitally because it's telecom after all everything has a record on it so the, the 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 motivation behind it is you know back to the scalability and opportunity that that it's creating and the disruption obviously because the incumbents are usually going to be at first against the idea because they see it as a threat to their ecosystem but honestly speaking it's actually i see it as a partnership because if you, um, if you look at how 5G is, as an example, it's all about densification. So how do you densify the deployment of these nodes? Do you think a centralized operation is gonna be able to deploy a thousand nodes overnight? Impossible, right? Even, even in a year, it would be a, a, a hard feat. So now there's a platform to allow them to do this seamlessly and with all the service level agreements that could be put in place without having to actually think that it's a disruptive model, if that makes sense, because now they're a part of that platform. I agree. Collabor te collaboration in telecom is something that's always existed, right? Um, to roam, you, you need to be collaborate. Um, interconnects, you need to collaborate. And now from what we feel as well, and I'm sure you do as well, um, there's around a trillion dollars, we estimate, it's an estimation, of spectrum that's unused right now. Um, that's a trillion dollars of spectrum that could be used elsewhere. But the mobile network operators, uh, they're holding this as an asset. Um, but the asset is slowly depreciating in the eyes of the um, AFCC, of the regulators, because they're not using it and half the world's unconnected. So I think you're right. They're, it's disruptive, our technology. Uh, but in the end, it's going to benefit everybody, including the mobile network operators, everybody involved. So James, just if you can build on what Sam has shared there, and Mickey as well for the benefit of the audience. If you look forward a couple, you're an inventor, you're looking at the future. You know, how do you see telecoms evolving? I mean, here we are today in the Middle East and in the UAE and Dubai, you're looking at things around the world. If you, if you were to say to the audience, what do you see the next transitions being? And the area that you're focusing world mobile is, as Samar said, in disrupting this oligopoly that ex of this model today, because blockchain and the metaverse so far has largely been about ecosystems and collaboration. Well, I, are we disrupting it? Possibly not, because if you just look at the situation, the, 
operators are not using the spectrum in a lot of the places and people are uncovered. So there's nothing to disrupt. We're trying to come in and do something that the structure of the economy has just left, uh, left, uh, uh, left out. Right, so people are left out. The carriers are also left out. It's not as if they're, they're being evil or, or bad in some way. It's just that's, that's the structure of the market. The structure of the market is wrong. Um, and, and so that's it. So the f first future of telecoms, I would say, would be that the structure of the market and the way that operators cooperate to use Spectrum will get better. Right? So much more sophisticated ways uh, of us using it rather than the current situation, which is either you have frequency one, you have frequency two, go, right? Which is the, the standard auction method. Or you have frequency in this country and you have frequency in that country, go. And the, the biggest uh, ITU conference that was recently was because in Asia, there's lots of countries where the largest city borders directly on the other country's largest city. So one operator builds all their infrastructure on the frequency. The other builds it on the same frequency. They're in different countries, so that the regulator says they shouldn't interfere. But the physicist, the engineer goes, of course they're going to interfere. It's a nightmare. Yeah, no, and, and uh, definitely, um, uh, like I love the US model with the whole CBRS idea, the whole citizens broadband radio system, which is basically lightly licensed spectrum. And what that means in the US is you could, anybody can go and apply based on a latitude longitude and you get the frequency allocated to you, which enabled an entire ecosystem to develop. And a lot of companies that are now being deployed based on this whole CBRS spectrum. If every country took that initiative and actually gave the opportunity for companies that don't have to bid on licensed spectrum for billions of dollars, imagine what the result could be. Now, you know, the model obviously doesn't apply in a lot of places. However, uh, the, the, the blockchain technology could fit perfectly with that model because now you're enabling something that is a depreciating asset, as Mickey said, right? You want to deploy it now so you can monetize on it now. So I've learned a few things so far. There's a trillion dollars of unused spectrum out there. We're talking, Mickey, about the sharing economy, what, uh, what Sam has just shared already about CBRS and what's happening in the US. So if I'm to take a decentralized model, perhaps, or blockchain, and what are you, what are you offering in terms of World Mobile you know, for people to participate in uh, being part of the network? A bit like the Airbnb or the Uber model of telecoms. Could you, could you share your, how, what you're actually doing to change this oligopoly from that perspective from the user or the customer side? Well, simply we've built technology to go where they cannot go. That's the first thing. So rather than stepping on my toes and entering into the market with a, with a huge budget in order to take a user from one network and bring them to yours and then the churn and the turn, uh, we decided that the best approach was for the 3.5 billion people that don't have internet. So we built a model uh, with James where we're building and have built long range radios that can actually be floated uh, on aerostats. When you get up to an aerostat, you can see very, very far. Uh, when I say very far, into the horizon, around a 65 to 75 kilometer to radius. And if you go up to the stratosphere, which that technology isn't quite ready yet, um, you're able to see around 600 kilometers. So you've got this ubiquitous coverage. There's other decentralized protocols and networks out there right now that can provide you private 5G, um, but it's, um, it's a good fit for somebody in a house who doesn't have their own internet and their neighbor. Uh, it's a good fit for IoT, but there's not really any revenue yet in IoT. So to actually make a decentralized network pro profitable, um, you need to make sure that money runs through it. In order to make sure money runs through it, you need to be able to make sure that all of you in this room can utilize that with ease. So that's not, no easy feat. That's very difficult. It's, uh, it's hard to make the agreements. It's, it's, uh, it's complex, but that's what's needed to make a decentralized network run properly. What does properly mean? It means that everyone who is a node owner or a node operator is actually making money. Because if people don't make money, they're not incentivized, the majority. There's some of us that are good, that have the money and would like to just help, um, but this is not sustainable. People need to earn value from the assets that they put down on the grounds in order to continue to put more assets on the grounds to maintain those assets and to keep those assets running. So that's what we're doing. We're doing it properly. So Mickey, what you're saying is uh, people can participate and buy a node in Well Mobile Network. What we're saying is we believe that we can build 
with collaboration, for example, with Samir, uh, with his network, if we work together, we're unstoppable. The current market is $2.8 trillion for just data and calls. If you think about value-added services, financial inclusion, insurance, banking, all these different things, before you even talk about entertainment, add another 20, $15 trillion, $20 trillion on top of that. So what we believe is there's plenty enough to share if it's done properly, and there's plenty enough to make if the network works properly. Okay, we've got five minutes left, so I'd like to give James a chance to just talk about how the economics of this work from a technology point of view. If you're inventing a new approach, does that benefit get passed on to the, the customer? And uh, or, or anything else you want to emphasize in your message for the uh, audience before we finish up and take some questions? And I'll leave the last point for Samar. Okay, well, let me, let me give you a pop quiz to do uh, just first. So Samar asked the question, you know, will CBRS be successful by right, opening up Spectrum? But we know the answer to that because of Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi today carries 95% of the radio traffic to our telephones worldwide, okay? It's about 200 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, there's about six gigahertz of spectrum that we use on a mobile phone routinely, maybe five and a half, okay? So someone could do the maths and work out what the efficiency ratio is there, right? It's, it's, tw it's uh, 95% of the data goes over 200 over six gigahertz of spectrum. So that's that, you know, so it's very, very successful. So we're trying to open up spectrum so that it can be shared in the same sort of way that Wi-Fi has done without destroying its range. Because remember, Wi-Fi doesn't go very far because we all use it and we all interfere with each other. So that's the kind of economic point. Um, and then the, the trick, of course, is that you know, uh, in this room, we're all consuming uh, radio, but we're all doing it fairly inefficiently. So what we actually need to do is to, to spatially multiplex the radio so each of the people in this room gets a beam or a signal and therefore a full bandwidth beam and signal as opposed to me just blanketing all of you with a signal and, and basically you know, wasting the spectrum here. It's just a very narrow experience of, of countries, right? This is one country, this is other country. You know, I should be able to beam at you independently. So we need to, to do some technology work to be very efficient with the spectrum. And then the economics, if you make it sufficiently open, should work. Yeah, I love those analogies, James. So I'll leave the closing comment to yourself, Samar, and then we'll take some questions. So where do you think things are going to end up and what are you going to do to make it happen? So uh, I sit in a bit of a unique position because I'm not just the disruptor trying to you know, force blockchain on anybody. I'm actually the mobile network operator in Canada and in some places, the only mobile network operator in some of the communities that only have maybe 1,000 people, 2,000 people. So as, a, as an MNO, I would love for a platform that allows me for some, like a customer that, said, that calls me and says, hey, I have one bar. When are you guys going to come and deploy? And guess what? These, these are Arctic conditions. I can't deploy for half the year. So I have to wait, even if I wanted to deploy immediately. We're talking about a six months delay in some cases, but RF planning takes years, right? I would love for a platform to come and say, you know what, customer, log into this platform. You're going to make money. You'll be my landlord and I will pay you gladly to serve the community. So that's where like, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing uh, technology. And the only way it works is the incentivization mechanism, which is that token, right? And that circular economy where you can incentivize until you build the network effect so that customers can actually benefit. Because maybe one node is not enough, right? You need a few. So um, yeah, it's, it's really, uh, I was only exposed to blockchain about a year and a half ago. And to me, it's like, wow, this is phenomenal, right? And, and we should definitely use this more often as a mobile network operator. Okay, that's great. So, Mickey, anything you want to clarify before we finish off? I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. So, if there are, take one question, one question from the audience. Okay, and then we'll. I suspect you're familiar with Helium. How does your business model differ from Helium? And and because that's a very simple model to describe. Uh, how does it differ uh, and how is it better? It makes money. 
That's the first differentiation. The second one, it's a full cellular service. Helium doesn't have E911. Helium doesn't have the necessaries at the moment. I'm sure they will. They have 900,000 nodes out there. But as a comparison, World Mobile has 125 nodes, making triple the amount of money than Helium has with its 900,000 nodes. They came in with an approach to provide IoT. They did fantastic. They, we saw the sharing economy, the appetite for it. But in reality, they had to change. They had to change their business model. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we would be up for collaborating with Helium, with Pollen, with Samir, with everyone, because I think collaboration is the way to do it. Together, against the oligopoly, we turn the oligopoly to be a collective. And with that collective, together with everybody in this room, everybody around the world, we're unstoppable. And that's what it comes down to. Second question, CBRS, what, is the, what does it take to get that rolled out beyond the US? James can answer this better well, there, than I can. There's a lot of countries that are toying with, with uh, a similar to model to CBRS. Um, and at the moment, it's not just a sort of uh, automatic system. So you can apply for a license in the UK and in Germany and the Netherlands and a bunch of places, and you will get a letter back from the government within a couple of months that says yes or no. Uh, there's a, couple of, you know, a bunch of countries behind that who have... Uh, talking shops, basically, trying debating what rules they could have. Um, India, for example, had a, um, kicked off a program like four years ago, but we've just not seen any output from that. So I think it's going to come because CBRS is going to be such uh, a significant part of the US market that every, no regulator will be able to tolerate a question from their, their audience and go, oh, we just don't know, right? It, it's going to happen. We're, we're out of time, so I would like to give the last word some... Sh just uh, yeah, I'm just going to add more questions afterwards. I'm just going to add a, uh, something to that point. Uh, Helium actually did us a favor by proving the model. The only problem is they're landlocked to the U.S. now because of the CBRS limitation. However, that's why the participation of MNOs is crucial to roll this out and connect the unconnected, which is one third, 33 percent of the world is unconnected. Okay, that's us done, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Angus. And for our audience, thank you, please. everybody. Thank you very much. We're ten minutes over, so. Thank you for the opportunity and I'll pass over to our next moderator.